Please grab a seat. So, um, I don't know if any, any of you guys are local. Awesome, so you guys probably all know Joe. Uh, I got to meet him a couple years ago. Uh, I sat in the stairs watching one of his one of his con talks. Um, awesome. He's a Navy veteran, a submariner, and um, prolific uh, social engineer as well as red teamer. Um, this is one that I'm going to sit in the, in the audience and watch too. But uh, anyways, Joe Gray. Thank you. Alright, so welcome to Social Forensication. This is a, multidis a multidisciplinary approach to social engineering. Before I get started, the thoughts and opinions I express are not those of IBM. I say this because, uh, though I don't admit it, I'm a senior security architect at IBM. Um, about me, uh, from the social engineering perspective, I'm the 2017 DerbyCon Social Engineering Capture the Flag winner. Uh, I was on the third place team last year at NOLACON in the OSINT CTF uh, as part of the Password Inspection Agency. Uh, I'm going to be back there in about three weeks to try to win. Um, I've got some certifications. I write for Forbes from time to time, and uh, I started tra offering training through uh, what I'm calling OSINT Associates, so uh, be on the lookout for that as well. I'm probably going to take the training on the road and not do as much online as I used to. Um, because the black badge for DerbyCon was handmade, um, and it took almost a year to make it, uh, it's very delicate. Uh, it doesn't leave the house, but there's a picture of it. So it, it lights up, it's really blinky, it's really nice, and um, yeah, it, it's a shame that I'm not going to be able to black badge after this year. So if you run a conference uh, and you want to accept this black badge, I would be more than happy to uh, take you up on that. Um, this is the closing ceremony. Anyone who knows me knows I never shut up, but uh, I was absolutely speechless that day, so I figured it was worth capturing. Uh, so anyway, into, the, um, into this, we're going to talk very briefly about the basics of social engineering, just to kind of level the playing field in terms of what social engineering is and it isn't. And then we'll talk about some existing techniques, um, we'll see some familiar faces with regards to social engineering, and then we're going to talk about um, memory forensics and rogue Wi-Fi attacks, uh, and then talk about considerations, execution, mit uh, mitigations, and I've got recorded demonstrations as well, so I don't have to make any sacrifices to the demo gods. Um, so with that being said, social engineering, in essence, is human hacking. You're trying to influence, not manipulate, someone into doing something that may not be in their best interests. Those things could be uh, performing an action, opening the email, clicking a link, executing a file. It could be giving you information. What was your mom's name before she was married? Uh, what's your password? Um, for anyone who's wondering, my social security number is 07805-1120. If you Google it, you'll find out why I'm readily uh, able to give that away, um, because it may not be mine. Um, it may not be anyone's anymore. Um, and it's not the LifeLock guy, I'll tell you that now. <laughs> I, I'm sure all the scammers are onto that already, so I had to go a little bit old school with that. So anyway, with regards to social engineering, we've got various types. Social engineering is a very large umbrella that encompasses numerous things. So when we hear social engineering, we have two schools of thought. One immediately thinks of phishing and phishing. The other thinks of someone wearing a black hoodie, sneaking in through the window, picking locks, uh, dodging uh, lasers with sharks, and all that fun stuff. Um, and this one really actually is more on the physical side, which is uh, somewhere where I'm not exactly as comfortable as I am with, say, phishing and phishing. Um, it's worth noting that dumpster diving and baiting are also considered uh, social engineering, but uh, they're not really going to be addressed in this. Uh, with regards to social engineering, there's a lot of complexity to it. Uh, unlike other disciplines within InfoSec, like AppSec, for example, it's basically architecture, programming, and security. With this, because the human element is involved, you have to take into account things like improv and acting. When you're on a phishing call, and I'll go ahead and tell you, um, right after this talk, I'm going to eat a very quick lunch, and then I'm going to come back to the stage, and I'm going to start calling scammers. Um, on speakerphone, and I'm going to try to get some information out of them and waste their time just for our own uh, laughter. Thanks. But because we're interfacing with the human element, we're trying to influence humans to do things, we have to have a certain level of psychology associated with it. And honestly, as a professional, I would feel inadequate if I didn't mention technical writing because I don't care what role you're doing in InfoSec, whether you're a system admin, a SOC analyst, a red team, or a blue team, or whatever. You're going to have to do technical writing. You're going to have to write reports. Someone, they may not read it, 
uh, but you're going to have to write it. It's, it's the deliverable. Um, so getting into the psychology of social engineering, this is all based on Dr. Robert Cialdini's Six Principles of Persuasion that he outlined in his books, uh, Influence the Psychology of Persuasion, I think it was 2006. Um, and I'll just run through these very quickly um, from the lens of a car salesman. Uh, those who took my class yesterday, you know exactly where I'm going with this. But, I mean, it's the easiest way to kind of explain it because most people have dealt with car salespeople at some point. Um, so, reciprocity, uh, sometimes referred to as quid pro quo. Um, you pay an extra $500 for this car, I'm going to take you uh, for a steak dinner. And, okay, sure, that sounds like a good idea. Um, where do you have in mind? I I'm thinking like Morton's, Ruth's Chris, Fleming's. Um, when, when the car salesman actually attempted that on me, um, he agreed to, uh, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with it, but it was Ryan's Steakhouse, which is like a buffet. I was like, I'm not paying 500 extra dollars for this. We're, we're gonna go to Fleming's and I'm gonna get like some of that expensive whiskey. Even though I don't like whiskey, I'm probably gonna spit it out. <laughs> but I'm gonna spend your money. I don't like caviar, but I'll probably try it. I'll probably spit it out too. Um, I'll probably order a bottle of Dom Perignon uh, with a side of orange juice and just make my own mimosas. <laughs> but anyway, commitment and consistency. We don't necessarily see this in car salespeople too often because they're only focused on the right now. They're not focused on the long-term game. So if they were to do it, it would be someone that you've repeatedly bought a car from and they're gonna say something like, I've always done right by you. I consistently look out for you. I, I've even taken um, negative commission for you or something to that effect. Um, but where we really see it is in the long-term tech sales. Uh, people working at, I mean, I'm not hating on CDW when I say this. It's just the only company that comes to mind right now. Um, but Somebody will work there, you move jobs, they see it on LinkedIn, they're going to hit you up. They move to another company, they're going to hit you up and offer you everything that they're selling there, whether it be the same or different, and that's the long-term sales game. If they stay committed and consistent to someone, it's expected that that person will continue to buy from them. Social proof. A good case of this is you walk to a car dealership and you're trying to buy a Ford Taurus. And they say successful people of your age are driving Mustangs or Z4 Roadsters. It's like, no. When I ran into that, it was four days after I had flipped my RX-8. I walked away from it, so it was all good. But when they put me towards that Z4, I was like, here are pictures of my RX-8 from Monday that I flipped and walked away. I don't want a convertible. I'm traumatized. I made it feel like that tall. It was beautiful. <laughs> I don't normally go that route. Uh, scarcity, I'm skipping authority for right now. Um, but scarcity, uh, it's the age old, hey, um, somebody just came in here and looked at this car, they went down the street to the bank to get financing, but if you can get financed before then, it's yours. The same dealership that tried to put me in the Z4 tried that, it was a Sunday. <laughs> what kind of bank is this person going to? Hmm, okay. Authority, uh, that's saying, um, for example, Kim Kardashian drives this car. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. Um, or Donald Trump endorses this car. Not even going to go there. Um, <laughs> the dealership that pulled this uh, stupid stuff on me, they tried it too. Uh, I was looking uh, at a Volkswagen CC. They come out, they've got the paperwork, they're trying to get me to sign the offer. I'm like, okay, cool, I'll look at it. The number doesn't add up, it's like $2,500 off. Not in my favor. And I was like, why is this higher? They're like, oh, um, there was a problem with the internet pricing. What was on the internet was incorrect. Okay, so you're trying to bait and switch. Sure. I need to see this itemized. We, we, we can't do that. Why? Well, we just can't. We don't, we don't normally do that. Well, if you want to make this sell, you're going to. No. So I get up and I go to walk out. They're like, okay, we'll itemize it. So here comes the itemized list. Gaps on there, it had just saved my skin with the RX-8, so I was like, yep, gap's cool. And then I see warranty. I didn't ask for a warranty. They're like, but this is a certified car, you have to buy a warranty. No, I don't. Number one, this is a Ford dealership. You cannot certify a Volkswagen. Number two, there's nothing requiring me to buy a warranty. They're like, yeah, there is, it's a state law. I lived in Georgia at the time. I didn't know anything about buying cars in Georgia, except, except for the hustle itself. Um, I didn't know if there was a state law about it or not, so I was like, I'm genuinely curious. I want to find out about this. Um, 
So what's the statute? What's the code for this? Oh, it's not published. <laughs> I don't think this is how that works. Needless to say, I rage quit. I walked out the door. And um, I may have created quite a few accounts to write some really scathing reviews about them. <laughs> And I may have even been known that uh, upon occasion, uh, if I saw the specific salesperson that I was dealing with and I drove by, I may have shown him he was number one. <laughs> anyway, so moving into the attack stage of things. Uh, I'm sure most of the people in here may recognize uh, this upstanding gentleman. Uh, he was on a uh, show on, I believe, the Discovery Channel. Uh, he's known to break into banks, sometimes the wrong banks. Sometimes he drinks a lot of Diet Pepsi and has to pee really bad and that sometimes leads to the wrong banks. But anyway, uh, with him, with Jason Street, um, he's been known to sneak into places and plug things in. Typically, a rubber ducky. Not the one that Ernie's friends with, the one that uh, Darren Kitchen's friends with. So with that, there's a lot of things you could do with a ducky, but typically Jason stops right there at the, point, at the proof of concept saying, hey, I've plugged this in. Uh, you are not secure. And it may, it may send an email, it may send a shell back or something, just for further proof, but it's nothing, it's nothing sinister. So, I, I love to take other people's research and build upon it and twist things a different way. Just because, I mean, that's how we grow, that's how we learn, that's how we build defenses. Um, it, it goes back to that whole thing where people say there's like three original lines of code and everything else is just plagiarism. Pretty much the same concept. So for what I'm going to talk about, these are the things you need. Um, we've got the external hard drive and a regular thumb drive on the top left and bottom right. Uh, on the bottom left and top right, we have Hack 5 products, one being a Bash Bunny, the other being a Rubber Ducky. Uh, they are very similar in nature. Uh, basically, they inject keystrokes. That's how they bypass the any DLP protection, data loss prevention um, tools that a computer may have. So basically, it connects to the computer and tells the computer, hey, I'm a keyboard, and it just types the things in, you script it in uh, ducky code or ducky script, um, and then you can put it on there and it works like a champ. Uh, other things you'll need for this uh, vector, of course you'll need some sort of computer, you'll need volatility, uh, or you could use recall if you so choose, um, no right or wrong answer there. Uh, and if you're going the free route, um, I would say FTK Imager Lite. Uh, there are a couple of considerations with that because FTK Imager Lite only works with Windows. I'll address the other platforms later. So for this attack process, basically we're going to gain access. And when I say gain access, I'm referring to physical access. We're going to roll in with a badge like this that may say FireEye, CrowdStrike, Carbon Black. Um, the company I used uh, for all of this is called Legitimate Forensics Company. <laughs> so it's abbreviated leg 4 co So uh, with this, uh, you get in, you impersonate a forensic consultant. And using those principles of persuasion, uh, compounded with a little bit of fear, you can probably get someone to let you get on their computer. The key is, though, you don't want to do anything that's going to let them set off any alarms. So the spiel I cooked up was... I'm a forensic consultant with a legitimate forensics company. We've been contracted by your company because malicious activity has been observed coming out of your network and it's been observed going in your network. Your computer itself is not infected. You've done nothing wrong. I just need to check the system out and get a memory image because one of the infected machines was observed communicating with this and we want to make sure it didn't move the malware in. Is there really malware on their network? I don't know, could be. I mean, there are some sophisticated actors out there. Uh, there are a lot of people who lack in basic security principles. There's a good chance there may be. But in this case, you don't know of anything specific. You're, you are saying things to the uh, victim in a way that A, you're not gonna make them feel like they've done something wrong and get scared. And B, you don't want them to raise any alarms and question you and ask anyone, is this legit? I mean, I work for a legit forensics company, of course it's legit. But anyway, um, you're gonna build a rapport, you're gonna use that spiel. Uh, you might uh, give them some compliments, uh, talk about the weather. Um, if you're around this area, you might be able to talk about like the Royals, the Chiefs, barbecue, craft beer. Um, 
If you're in Louisville, they're all about the bourbon, the craft beer, and there's a lot of foodies there. Uh, you can run with that. Something to build rapport, make them feel easy. Because here's the thing. You have to coexist and get along with these people for ever how long it takes you to gather your memory image. So if you're targeting someone with a very small computer, you're talking four to eight minutes. If you're talking uh, someone with 12 gigs plus, you're talking close to half an hour or more. So you got to break out of the whole antisocial, built down like a, a hacker with the black hoodie and the sunglasses and all that fun stuff. Um, you're actually going to have to play the role of someone who can communicate. So uh, if it's not your strong suit, you're probably going to want to rehearse that before you go in. Um, and there's going to be a lot of improv involved with that. So you convince them to take the image that's in line with building a rapport. Those middle three are pretty much, they should be stacked on top of each other, but that didn't make a pretty picture, so I left it that way. We acquire the memory image, and then we jet out the door. So with this, we don't want to be like the underpants gnomes. In InfoSec, you never want to be like the underpants gnomes. You know your starting point. You know your end point. You've got to find out the middle ground, and that's what the whole uh, building rapport, talking to the victim, gathering the image, and moving on is all about. So once you have it, you simply, I use the word mount, which is probably an incorrect term. You plug the drive that has the image in. You can use Kali or you can use SIFT, the SANS Investigative Forensics Toolkit. Uh, you can use the volatility modules. Both platforms have volatility natively built in. Uh, for my demos, I used SIFT because they have uh, a more robust library of modules to use. You, I could have added them to Kali, but I'm kind of lazy sometimes. So I was lazy that day. Uh, and then from there, um, to carry on like the Underpants Gnomes, Ponage. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. I've got some recorded demos that'll show that aspect. But in terms of gaining access, you might need business cards. You can use Vistaprint. You can go to Office Depot. To my knowledge, Vistaprint will not validate that you're an employee of anything. You can upload whatever you want and they will print it. I know for a fact Office Depot will not validate anything. Okay, cool. You can go get business cards made that say you're Leslie Carhartt and you work at Dragos if you'd like. I had to do it. Um, if you want an ID card, uh, you've got two choices. Run into SkyDog at a conference like I've done, or go to quickidcard.com. Again, I don't think they vet that you work where you say you work. Um, the common running joke within the social engineering community is you can get into anywhere if you have a clipboard. So it's a good idea to carry a clipboard. Take a laptop. Uh, you're going to need the laptop anyway, um, especially if you're going to do what I'm going to talk about later. Um, or maybe a briefcase or a backpack uh, to look more official. If you could pick up a company's uh, like briefcase of swag at a conference like Black Hat or RSA, that's even better. Or better, you could say you worked at RSA if you buy an RSA ticket and get their backpack. I mean, just think it. Um, but anyway, you have that uh, because, like, especially if you're using a Mac, you're going to have to have like 74.9 uh, dongles to be able to do most anything. Um, and then you need the solid pretext. Um, you might not want to roll in looking like this. Um, depending on how much knowledge and how mature the organization you're attacking is, this may go over well, it may not. People might just give you access to the computer out of pity, I don't know. Um, but this is here more as a joke. But anyway, some considerations. Uh, the main consideration for gathering the image is whether or not the target uses DLP software, data loss protection. Uh, and with that, DLP software typically will prevent any external uh, storage device from effectively mounting, so you cannot write to it. Sometimes you can't read from it either. Um, depending on the platform, you can configure either or both. Uh, then with that, uh, if you're going to get the memory image, uh, the person who's logged in that you're using either needs to be a local admin, and that's the major thing that I learned through this. Um, I got a, a very uh, harsh lesson in privilege escalation. Or you need to be able to use some sort of PowerShell script like PowerUp uh, or PowerSploit uh, to be able to uh, escalate your privileges. That's going to take a little bit more time. And the reason you have to have the privilege escalation is because to get the memory image, you have to be an admin. Um, I thought there may have been a way around it whenever I originally cooked up this idea. Um, thus far, I've not found anything. I'm continuing to research that. But anyway, you either prompt the user or you get the privilege escalation. 
If you don't succeed at either of those, I've got another thing you can do here in a little bit uh, that also involves a rubber ducky that's almost as sinister. Um, then you get the image and you walk out the door. Um, if they have a DLP, you can't just use a regular thumb drive. You've pretty much got to use a ducky or a bunny. Uh, you follow the same thing. You have to write this stuff in ducky script, which is a little bit challenging to learn, uh, but once you get it down, it's not too bad. There's actually a really good repository of existing ducky scripts out there that do a lot of fun things. So um, I created one that's on my GitHub, but it's kind of similar to, um, to some of the others that's out there. Um, for this, you'll also need uh, to flash the firmware with a thing called Twin Ducky, which will actually allow you to use it as a storage device. So DLP may stop that depending on how it's configured, but in all likelihood, probably not. And then the other steps, privilege escalation, gather image, walk out the door. So with doing this, we need some OSINT before we do it. Better OSINT makes better social engineering, right? Um, so we need to look at layer eight. Um, not the conference next month, but we need to look at the human element. We need to find out kind of how the culture of the organization is. We need to find out, do they have a culture of security or do they have what I call chronic number 17s? Uh, there's a, a debate group, uh, more or less troll group I'm a member of, and uh, we've categorized several personality types, and number 17 is the overshare. Doing OSINT, I like number 17s. They're always good for that. They tell you everything. Um, you can find out where they eat every day of the week, at what time, all of that fun stuff, and then uh, they will typically vent about work on social media, and quite frankly, more often than not, they don't have uh, privacy controls in place and everything's public. <coughs> Furthermore, you're going to need to scour career pages, LinkedIn, um, other platforms uh, as appropriate to ascertain which operating system they're using. Because with that, you're going to need connectors and dongles, and certain software will work with certain platforms. Uh, find out if they're using DLP. You can find that via the career pages, LinkedIn. Uh, you may even be able to find it uh, using something like DNS Dumpster, Hacker Target, Census.io, Netcraft, something like that. Uh, if, it, if they've got something that's public facing, uh, in some cases it'll be in their DNS records. I, I don't consider Proofpoint to be DLP, but you can identify when someone's using proof, Proofpoint solely from their DNS records. Um, furthermore, um, can you find out about any antivirus or EDR solutions that they're using? Because if you're going the privilege escalation route, you're going to have to bypass that. And if you can't, like, if you can find out what it is, you can test it and eventually find a way to get past it. User rights. You want to try to target someone who's a local admin. You don't want to go for IT because they're going to know if something's happening. You probably don't want to go with someone in purchasing or accounting because they're going to have knowledge of the contract. HR might be a good one, um, but you also don't want to go for someone that has too much memory. Like if you're targeting someone who has video editors or someone that's got, you know, 64 gigs of RAM, you probably don't want to target that. And then factoring in the time to collect. So your limitations, again, will be the user and the user's permissions. Uh, their vulnerability management posture will certainly be a factor as well for the privilege escalation perspective if they don't have local admin. And then the time, and I, I misquoted that as hours. Uh, I meant to update that on the slide, but I didn't. So it's two to two and a quarter minutes for each gig of RAM. So I tested it on a VM with two gigs. It took me four and a half minutes. I tested it on a physical machine with 12 gigs. It took me right at 26. So at this point, we've came up on a demo. So let me mirror my displays. So this right here is a pr um, running power up on a clean VM. Nothing's installed, no services are running. Uh, it's gonna fall flat on its face because it's as vanilla as the day is long. Uh, it's a short uh, demo. So in this case, I'm using PowerSploit. Um, so you see there's the default username. Uh, it's looking for some things. It's not, it's not having much luck. Uh, so that was pretty much that. Um, there's nothing there. So that just goes to prove that there has to be something to use. Oh boy. 
for whatever reason, I shifted off of mirrored displays. Ah, oh, I know what it is. No, I don't. Here we go. So this is power up on a dirtier machine that I just had sitting in my house that I've neglected for some period of time. Um, so as we see here, we're finding all sorts of things with like unquoted service paths to where you could do um, injection with that. There are a few opportunities um, for that type of stuff. And with that, um, know that this process takes a lot longer than this demo did. I actually cut a couple of things out that was just waiting installing and I sped the uh, pace up just in the uh, spirit of uh, timeliness with this. So with regards to that, you've got that act, that perspective. Ah. One of these days I'm going to swipe the right direction. So to actually get the memory image, um, this is just showing, if I can find my cursor, wherever it may be, there it was. Any other day, let me go back here and draw it again. Okay. There we go. So this is just showing um, running of FTK Imager. Um, there was the admin prompt. Um, there it goes running. Uh, for this specific host, this is the one that took about four and a half minutes. Um, you can get it to collect um, an AD1 file, a MIM file, and uh, the page file. They're all different uh, ways that you could analyze it forensically. Uh, so basically what we're doing is we're weaponizing digital forensics. Um, and in doing so, you can do it in various formats. AD1 uh, being a proprietary format from the company that actually makes uh, FTK Imager. So let me get back to the PowerPoint on my end. All right, here we go with that. So with Volatility, uh, Volatility is an open source memory forensics tool. Um, it's developed by a bunch of nice uh, people uh, down in the Louisiana area. Um, there's also Recall, which is now maintained by, I believe, Google. It was originally a fork of Volatility, so it started with the same source code. It's now built into Google Rapid Response. So um, if we were talking about a blue team type subject, uh, you can have uh, GUR installed with agents and collect live memory on the fly with that. Um, but for this, we're using uh, Volatility. It's native to Sift and Kali. I like to use these variables um, shown below to make my life easier, just so I don't have to define them every single time I run it. Uh, so export Volatility underscore location equals file. And yes, that is three slashes. It's meant to be that way. Path and file name, profile, uh, Volatility underscore profile. Um, and the syntax has actually changed for that Windows 10 thing. Uh, so whenever you actually collect a memory image, you need to open system and find out which version of Windows 10 because it's going to be Windows 10 underscore version number. They cut out that x64 part. So regarding that, there are a lot of useful modules in volatility. So the second one on the left, I think most of the people in this room may have heard of that, Mimi Cats. Um, you can actually execute Mimi Cats from volatility into a memory image and extract the passwords. There's an asterisk though. Um, the version of Windows 10 that I tested it against, it did not work. It does work against Windows 7 though. Um, but as things always go with Mimi Cats and with several other tools, they find a way, they publish their research, the attackers eat it up, it goes, it runs wild on your brother if you want to go Hulk Hogan style. Um, and then Microsoft fix it, fixes it. And then they have to find a new way. So it's like the constant battle of good and evil. Although, is anyone truly evil with this? But anyway, you could do things like dump hashes. Hmm, if only one could pass a hash. Hmm. Um, image info, that's going to give you details about the system. It's going to tell you the version and all that. If you weren't able to get it from looking at uh, the system um, menu in uh, control panel, you can get it here. It's a very time consuming process. I recommend doing it and going to bed. Uh, so you can do that. And then things like ConScan, uh, that's going to show you the connections. It's basically the equivalent of NetStat. Uh, you can look at history from like Internet Explorer, Chrome, Firefox, 
Uh, NetScan will do uh, something similar to ConScan. Um, I believe ConScan is for XP and older NetScan is the newer one. You can see what's in the notepad, you can take screenshots, you can dump it into a timeline, which that's more of a forensics thing if you're trying to do analysis. You can look at the services, and you can even see what was input into the command line via command scan. So there's a lot of things you could do here, maybe not necessarily to get maximum pwnage, if you will, but you may be able to get some creds, you may be able to understand some architecture, you may be able to enumerate some services that are running, and understand the user behavior. You could, for example, if you understand their browsing history and maybe what's typed into the command line, you could probably construct a good fish that they may fall for that would actually work. If you know that someone in accounting spends a majority of their day looking at elegant ladies' handbags, not that I've ever seen anyone's browser history say that, um, you might be able to send them a coupon to Macy's for some elegant women's handbags. You never know. Um, you'd have to find out what their definition of elegant is, though. But, I mean, that's another conversation for another day. Uh, but anyway, back to the limitations. FTK Imager Lite, as I said, only works with Windows. You can use Recall with Mac, and for Linux, there's a thing called Lime, um, all of which free open source. Uh, the operating system, Windows 7, it's a cakewalk. XP and before, it basically Windows 7 and older are cakewalks. 10 is a lot more difficult. There are plugins for Mac and Linux, uh, but uh, they're not, they're not as robust, and I don't have much experience playing with them, so I didn't want to include them with this. But then the other thing is, if you're doing this in a sense of consulting, as with everything, time. How many billable hours can you drop for this? How much time is the adequate amount of time to analyze this before you move on and just cut your losses or you know, have to move on to other work? Because, I mean, to be honest, if given an infinite amount of time, anyone can break into anything, given the time. It doesn't, there's always a way. So we're coming up on the next demo period, which will involve volatility. So this is the uh, volatility on Windows 7. I've got to move back because I lost my cursor again. One of these days, I will actually have a cursor I can find. So this is just uh, about a one minute uh, run. It's even showing like how terrible I am at typing sometimes. Uh, but basically, this is just showing how easy it would be to actually run with um, one of these systems. So showing Mimi Cats, there's some passwords. Somebody had a password of Dum Dum. There's uh, some network connections. There's some stuff that's been put in on the command line. Processes. Here's the process list. Uh, now we're going to look at uh, some DLLs. So if you want to try some uh, further uh, like OSCE level exploitation or process hollowing, here you go for that. This had a lot of DLLs. So now we're going to dump some certs. So you might be able to misuse one of those potentially. Lots of that and that's it for that one. Now, on the flip side, here's Windows 10, and here's what we're pretty much not able to get. So, same thing. This one's a little bit longer, uh, but we get a lot less out of it. So, it was against 10586, that's the Windows 10 version. Mimi Cats, nothing. Hash dump, nothing. NetScan, we get a little bit out of that. So that's somewhere that we can work with. And keep in mind the system was incredibly vanilla, nothing installed, so therefore um, that's why it's not showing very many processes. Um, but this is even showing more information about those processes. And now we're going to um, look at the SID so we can see what users are there. Um, again, I apologize it moved so fast, but I didn't want to absorb too much time because the focus isn't necessarily the volatility piece. It's partly the volatility piece, but it's also the um, gaining access and everything around it with the considerations as well.
So um, that's why I kind of sped things up. Um, and this process, if I recall correctly, took me about four hours um, per host, just because it, it's a very tedious process. Okay, so that's done. So from here, moving away from the forensics perspective into like rogue Wi-Fi. Why would we do rogue Wi-Fi? Well, it's simple. You're already carrying a backpack so that you can gather this memory image. Uh, or you're carrying a backpack because you're going to attempt to collect a memory image and you may fail. So with doing so, this is adding a second layer to it. And honestly, I don't, I'm not saying social engineers don't look at other disciplines like forensics and wireless hacking, but it's something you don't see as often. So I'm trying to more or less encourage people interested in social engineering and existing social engineers to broaden your horizons and look at uh, building further attack vectors. So in doing so, with a rogue Wi-Fi access point, you can do it very easily. You can buy an alpha network card off Amazon for 30 bucks. You can get a really nice one that covers both the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz for 59 bucks. For a lot more, you can also get a Wi-Fi pineapple from Hack5. Does the same thing. But basically, if you want to do it without the Wi-Fi pineapple, you can put it with a Raspberry Pi, uh, the EC uh, Council Storm Kits, like the touchscreen Raspberry Pis that they have uh, for their ethical hacking class like yesterday. Uh, you can connect it to that as well. Put a battery pack in, throw it in a backpack. You're virtually undetected. Uh, as long as you're not like dark matter in the Wi-Fi cactus. Uh, anyone who's seen that picture or seen the cactus and live in the flesh knows exactly what I'm talking about. It basically just comes all the way up. It's nothing but intense. Um, so with that, uh, you can do it. You can walk around. Uh, you can even get some preliminary information from a website called Wiggle, uh, W-I-G-L-E. I think it's .net. Uh, you can go there, put in the uh, geographic location and look at what wireless networks have been mapped there already. Uh, if you want to go further, you can actually get a GPS antenna and connect to your device and collect information to upload to Wibble, if you so choose. A GPS antenna, I think, is uh, $39 on Amazon, if I recall correctly. I don't remember what I paid. But anyway, you can do it. Um, you could do it off your regular computer as well, but for remaining undetected, you could do it something that sim so small that it will fit in a briefcase, a backpack, or if you want to really get... Um, what I would call simplistically uh, sophisticated. Put some cardboard, taking up halfway across a box of donuts and get like donuts on the other half. People will break their neck to talk to you to get the donuts and you can just waltz right in. You don't even have to lie about who you are. They'll just let you in to get the donut and you can just get the wireless right there. Run the fake Wi-Fi access point, get people to connect. That's one perspective. Uh, and then once you get them to connect, then you can run your own proxy, you sniff out all their traffic, game over. Alternatively, um, if you could get into like a bathroom, um, like a, I mean, I don't really advocate this, but like a breastfeeding room somewhere that you could sit for 15, 20 minutes, you don't even really need that much time. You could throw up the antenna and run the full air crack, air crack suite against it and gain access to the wireless network, and then just be able to sniff, scan, and do whatever. So it's really not that, uh, that sophisticated. And the, the suite is really easy. So uh, I've got the final demo here that is of the wireless persuasion. Um, I'll start out with this. This is the Dougie script that I wrote called Wi-Fi Stealer. So I'm gonna plug it into a Windows host it's going to execute, and this was as a result of figuring out that I didn't have an administrator account in the simulated environment that I could collect memory from. So this is done from a user account. And, uh, I mean, it's pretty sinister. So it's just going to pop up. Um, now we're going to see things start. There we go. There's the one-liner. So it's getting all the information. It's writing it to a text file. There's the text file, and there's the text file. So it saved it to the uh, Ducky, and it also saved it to the desktop. And right there we see that the wireless SSID, the network name is Let's Talk About Hex Baby. And it has open authentication, 
which does not mean that it doesn't require a password, it just means that you don't have to have any uh, shared key authentication with it. Um, and that in the hex, that actually spells F-A-C-E-B. Um, so that's uh, it's a one-liner you can get. It's on my GitHub. Uh, I've got a link to it at the end of the presentation. Oh, this is just too much fun today. Okay. So, I go back. That's not the slide I was looking for. I spoke too soon about the demo gods. Let's go this route. I'll show you. So, close the memory analysis. Here we go. Um, so, this is Wi Fi cracking with memory analysis, I think. I want to make sure that I'm on the right one. So, this one's just showing how to find a Wi Fi pineapple once I find my cursor. So, basically, when we're looking, um, you can just sniff out, and right there it is, pineapple underscore B1E1. Uh, that's actually part of the MAC address of the Wi Fi pineapple. So, uh, by default, this is just more of a cautionary tale of if you're going to use a pineapple, make sure you change your SSID so that uh, people can't say it. So, now that one, uh, to be honest, that. Uh, Pineapple broadcast as SSID as not a pineapple anymore. So um, if if someone catches on to me, I might change it to something like pina colada. Because no one would ever suspect that, right? So this is like running through the process of cracking a wireless network. So first we use Airmon, which is just going to put our alpha card into monitor mode, basically promiscuous mode. Here we see the wireless networks around. There's uh, Tell My Wi-Fi Lover, there's Yjitsu, there's Let's Talk About Hex Baby, all sorts of fun stuff. So for this one, we're targeting Yjitsu, so we see that it's on channel one. We're targeting the ESSID, which is the name. The BSSID is the MAC address of that. So we've got that going on, so we're just gonna play with some um, air dump uh, and air replay tools. Uh, air dump being basically the PCAP platform for this. It's going to let you gather the packets necessary to do things. Uh, Airbase uh, being the tool that's going to be the fake uh, access point. And then we can use um, Air Replay to do things like fake authentication uh, and deauthentication attacks to the wireless network so that the hosts that are connected to it will have to re authenticate so that we can capture those initialization vectors and those packets so that we can crack them at a later time. So it's running through right now, um, doing a few different things. Uh, defrag attacks are fun as well. Um, a lot of this I picked up uh, working on the OSWP. So here, the minus zero and minus zero space zero, that's um, an infinite loop. Uh, deauthentication attack. Uh, in a sense, it's kind of like a wireless denial of service. Uh, if you want to mess with your neighbors, I don't. I don't encourage that, but you could. As we can see, this is also a WPA2 network. So, you know, this is the strongest um, encryption that we can use in a wireless setting until WPA3 comes out on the widespread. So here's the cracking of it. We've got enough. We've got enough packets. So we see it's running, running, running. There's the password. That password is included in rockyou.txt, and it took um, 29 minutes and 12 seconds. So, and the thing is, because it's a nine character password, it contains three typefaces. This actually meets a lot of organizations' complexity requirements. So the moral of that story is lock your authentication down, use strong passwords, use passphrases, um, you know, with every opportunity you have, um, if you can use some sort of PKI, uh, by all means, do so. So, uh, shifting gears, um, Through the Hacking Glass is uh, a mentorship platform that Brian Austin and I co-founded. Uh, there was another group of people around uh, DEF CON 2017 that were claiming to be mentors and uh, were outed as frauds. Brian and I were rather 
irritated at that, so we decided that we were going to uh, do something about it, and this is the byproduct. Basically, we understand that academia does what academia does, certifications do what certifications do, but that doesn't necessarily give you the 13 years of experience with Ethereum that you need to get that entry-level SOC analyst job. <laughs> Keep in mind, Ethereum's not been around for 13 years. Um, slight dig at the uh, companies looking for unicorns. Uh, but anyway, basically, we are looking at pairing people with experts um, or people who are more knowledgeable, maybe not necessarily experts, I know some people are afraid to use that term, but either way, uh, to help you go through a process and learn a discipline. We're looking at uh, paths including hardening, uh, monitoring, attacking, uh, forensicating, and analysis. Basically, when you go through this, you'll be paired with somebody, they'll give you some learning exercises, uh, you'll probably be expected to write some blog posts, um, which could be published to whatever platform you choose, uh, whether it be your own platform, peer list, uh, if you'd like an, in, uh, an introduction with uh, Kate Brew at Alien Vault, she's always looking for people and they will treat you very well. Um, but either way, you do that and then when your mentor feels that you're appropriate and when we actually have it fully built out, there's a range where everybody will converge. Someone will have a set amount of time to harden a system or systems depending on which complexity level they're on. Once the hardening is complete, we're going to pass it off to someone to monitor and someone to attack simultaneously. Once that phase is done, it'll be passed off to someone to basically conduct incident response, uh, taking the notes from the person doing the monitoring, and then at the end, once everything is put together, someone will analyze it for threat intelligence, all that fun stuff, and then all parties will sit down um, on a WebEx or something comparable and discuss everything. So the pen tester, the person in that role, can tell the person who hardened the system, hey, you forgot to change this one setting, it allowed me access. Or, hey, I really appreciate that you did this, it made my life miserable. Thank you. And everybody can hear everything. So, in a sense, it's kind of like a purple team thing, but not really. Uh, I'm kind of apprehensive of the term purple team. But anyway, there's the information if you're interested. Um, if you look at the Twitter or the Facebook page, uh, basically enrollment is handled via the mailing list right now. Uh, we're in the process of pairing the mentors and mentees. Um, we have a, an extremely disproportionate uh, ratio of people seeking to be mentees as opposed to mentors. You can be both, so if you feel that you can mentor someone in one discipline and learn another one, sign up, please. Um, here's my upcoming speaking engagements. Next week's gonna be uh, pretty hellacious. Two days in Boston, Knoxville, and Atlanta. Uh, then New Orleans, uh, training in Columbia, and then um, all that fun stuff. Uh, Hacker Halted, if you wanna come to Hacker Halted. Uh, actually, the CFP is still open until the 30th. Uh, so get your submissions in, but if you don't want to talk and you just want to come, right here's a coupon code that you can get free admission. Um, share it with all your friends. I don't mind at all. Uh, the more the merrier. Um, I know some people are hesitant to click um, bit.ly links given to them by a social engineer, so there's the full, uh, there's the full URL, and if you want to go to it yourself and for fear of me poisoning, uh, Eventbrite, you can go ahead and go there yourself and use the coupon code. If you want 15% off training, that's good for Certified Ethical Hacker, ECSA, LPT, CC, so whatever. Um, you can use the coupon code there at the bottom as well. So uh, there's that. And in the meantime, before I share links, any questions? Okay, so here's the links to the stuff I used if you want to um, use play with it yourself. Uh, so, as we can tell, it's a lot of stuff on uh, GitHub. Wait, there's more! <laughs> Thanks! Oh, I went too fast. So, if you want the um, Wi-Fi Stealer script, it's there. Uh, whenever I find the time, if I ever find the time, I'm going to write some more scripts and put into that specific directory. Um, but um, that's pretty much uh, all I have in that directory. Uh, again, uh, before I put the final two slides up, uh, I'm gonna grab lunch really quick and then I'm gonna come back up here and start calling scammers and wasting their time. So uh, for this talk, that's all folks, and there's QR codes. <laughs>